so you may know that I have have studied this matrix of repeatable spatial formulas or spatial products that constitute an enveloping urban medium or spatial technology, something like multiple spatial operating systems, a technological matrix that's creating de facto forms of polity that are often outpacing law and rapidly generating a new layer of the Earth's crust. I can't report that there's a single monolithic enemy in this suit, no elementary particle. It's worse than that. There is a spectrum of dangers from capitalism and fascism and racism and whiteness and sectarian violence and religious intolerance and xenophobia and sociopathic leaders and countless other means of hoarding authoritarian power and oppressing others and abusing the planet and many intractable dilemmas related to labor abuse, inequality, and climate cataclysm. Abstract financial variables of capital can inflict harm from the scale of the house to the scale of the free zone engine rooms of neoliberalism that remove inconvenient obstacles to profit like taxes and labor unions and environmental regulation a braid of whiteness and national logics and the remnants of empire have for centuries delivered that harm disproportionately to people of color. And the global infrastructure space is perfectly streamlined in the movement of billions of products and in the minds of tourists and skilled laborers. But at a time when over 80 million people in the world are displaced, mobility related to conflict, climate, or labor confronts a nation state that only has a dumb on off button to grant or deny citizenship or asylum, and the NGOcracy only offers detention. Techno solutionist thinking is treated as a primary means to innovation, and political superbugs survive against all odds to attract arenas full of people willing to go over a cliff together for the drug of being told they're right. And human agents have also now managed to pass off agency to non-human biological agents or atmospheric chemicals. But exacerbating these dilemmas, it's a culture that you know, still looks for singular enemies and singular solutions. It's the culture that Walter Mignolo described yesterday, a culture that privileges declarations and right answers and universals. The old modern enlightenment mind still longs for ideational monotheism and monocultures of all sorts, for the righteous one and only in the Manichaean struggle, for utopias, ultimates, and bounded worlds parsed by an elementary particle. For the modern mind, there can only be successive rather than coexistent knowledge. The new right answer must kill the old right answer. It's a mind marked by whiteness, combat, and collapse written in the first person. These are the hackneyed plots of our humanities. And having eliminated the very information it needs, this culture is often then banging away with the same blunt, inadequate tools to deal with expanding territories and chemistries of power. If, if economic and military engagement or new technologies don't provide the solution, if consensus surrounding laws, management standards, or master plans provide no relief, um, if it can't be expressed in the anointed uh, digital, legal, or quantified languages, the smartest people in the world seem to stand with hand to brow. And uh, you know, activism itself even sometimes has its own orthodoxies that are measured in singular terms. Even the choice, as I said, you know, to, to work against a spectrum of evils uh, with equal force can be seen as a betrayal of any one singular fight. This is the, these are the lingering kind of category mistakes, mis mistaking of part for whole. It's a holdover of these habits of mind. And the world's superbugs, bulletproof forms of power, runaway markets run rings around singular solutions and singular evils. But what do we have to counter them? How, how do you drop through a trapdoor to engage 
something besides these logics. Um, and, and, you know, this, this would be usually the moment to, you know, where the speaker would unleash their radical new proposal. But in, in this case, that would be really sad, really conservative. On the flip side of those logics, nothing is new and nothing is right. There's only a chance to rehearse a habit of mind that's been eclipsed. Um, maybe to look at the world and see uh, with half-closed eyes that, that culture is good at pointing to things and calling their name, but not so good at describing relationships between things or the repertoires they enact. The looking past objects with names, lexical declarations, and quantifiable proofs you can detect a matrix or medium of activities and latent potentials in space. The undeclared dispositions that are something like culture's muscle memory. And, and nothing is new about this. You already know how to do it. It's a, uh, it's, you're doing it all day long. It's a, it's a blind spot that's right in front of you. It's a terra incognita where you've already been. And turning the sound down on declarations, maybe it's easier to detect the difference between what organizations are saying and what they're doing, how they're decoupling their, how their messages and ideologies are decoupled from their real activities and underlying potentials and dispositions. The smart city maintains the shine of the new while it centralizes information in ways that violate privacy with a network that's actually crude and primitive in disposition. Social media network purports to be information rich, filters all that information through a dumb binary of likes and dislikes or a sort of set, ranking set of hierarchies and tallies. A social media that, that is in the end a kind of whiteness machine par excellence. A global network of Dubai-style zone cities facilitates not its storied free trade, but manipulated trade. A centralizing power espouses a populist message. Both left and right-wing ideologies can result in concentrations of authoritarian power. And it's even easier to see the superbugs special power. They manipulate ideologies, conflating and confusing them to get to their real target, dispositions and temperaments. And if they can keep everyone in a divisive fight, they can harvest loyalties. They can do whatever they want to with you. It's wildly dangerous only to rely on what's declared when undeclared, this is blank slide, when undeclared activity or disposition can facilitate untouchable accumulations of power and environmental forms of violence. While culture relies on declarations, the deceptively simple fact of faculty for detecting a medium or matrix of dispositions, latent potentials and relationship and arrangement remains profoundly under rehearsed, under expressed. Uh, so beyond, uh, it'd be safer just to stay in a moment of rhetorical critique or or deliver to you a, a more precise quantification of our doom. Um, but uh, venturing into riskier territory, can you ask what are the forms for actually dulling these potentials for harm? Our activism will pursue uprising, rioting, marching, looting, blockading, boycotting, sanctioning, sabotaging, divesting, unionizing, legislating. But in addition to these, and only in addition to these, can you expand the activist repertoire with some shifted perspectives? And in addition to the anointed digital legal econometric languages, might some spatial variables offer uh, special powers? Uh, might it offer a, a, a mixing chamber for many partnerships and coalitions across disciplines. Just as this kind of thinking in the medium inverts the typical focus on object and matrix, working in this medium middle milieu may offer additional approaches to intractable dilemmas or a redoubled territory with some extra political and aesthetic capacities to outwit the superbugs. Um, for one thing in this medium, uh, Solutions are really weak positions. Uh, you know, no, nothing, no, nothing works. 
uh, no one thing works. To worry that things will go wrong is to miss the point. They will always go wrong. You can only try to achieve varying degrees of relief from violence to humans and the environment. Also, it's better um, from this perspective, not when you eliminate problems, but when you put them together in interplay, when you use them to leaven and catalyze each other. And more important than the modern succession of technologies is the coexistent relationship between emergent and incumbent technologies. Maybe, maybe it's, I'm getting another sound there. Um, maybe it's also a little easier to see latent violence, structural or slow violence that's embedded in spatial arrangements. So considering this latent temperament, it's easier to see, it's clearer to see that uprising, fighting and sabotaging and rioting, looting and agitating are the gentlest response to sustained and overwhelming environmental violence from powers that demolish and poison and subjugate and erase you, not just with a gunshot or a drawn sword, but with fossil fuels and sheltered wealth and monopolies of data and murderous policing. Considering this latent temperament, it's also clear that reasonable ideas confront divisive, unreasonable politics, and that activism requires the sneakiness to double cross political superbugs, to sometimes starve them of the fight they crave, or overwhelm them with stealthy, undeclared, non lexical space, environmental forms of design that fly under the radar. Maybe there are other ways to register the design imagination, you know, the design not only of objects, but the design of relationships between objects, interplay, interdependencies, chemistries, chain reactions, the design of a platform for inflecting populations of objects. Designing is entangling, designing is is making something that shouldn't always work, and that is indeterminate in order to be practical, um, so that it can adjust to changing conditions or to moments when it's politically outmaneuvered. Culture doesn't, doesn't reward this. Culture rewards right answers, quantifiable proofs, uh, homogenized, pasteurized, touring complete world, but the moment of innovation may be the lumpy, patchy, partial uh, moment, the moment that's impossible, the organization that's impossible to parse with an elementary particle. The world doesn't usually sit around waiting to congratulate you at the moment when your organization becomes curdled and lumpy, but I'm saying, I'm suggesting that this is the moment of innovation. It's not just the shiny new technology or algorithm or vaccine that is the innovation. It's the quality of the mixtures that signals sophistication. Innovation as the design of the way things go together. So a, a protocol of interplay uh, that you might be designing is then often involves the removal of obstructions. Um, the subtraction of, of design so that, so that agency can be returned to multiple authors of community still at the very moment that one shifts from uh, the destructive 30,000 foot view of the prescriptive planner. Um, you also confront a challenge from those calling for second order changes at a time of planetary crisis. So is it possible that some of these protocols might be subtraction protocols to put the development machine into reverse? How can these landscapes um, filled with multipliers and switches be carriers of an amplifying germ of their own reverse engineering um, without colluding? How can they short circuit or unwind abusive markets? How can they address a community scale as well as a planetary scale? So I'll, uh, 
think with me for a minute, if you will, with some examples. Uh, you know, consider uh, alternative land holding organs like community land trusts, agrarian trusts, other forms of commoning that refuse the logics of property and guard against gentrification and, and dispossession. And given that stability, it's also, it's also easier then to counter the automatic harm of thin financial abstractions with tangible, heavy, lumpy values to do with position, proximity, adjacency, sequencing, programming, solids, climate. You know, capital is just so stupid. It manages to obstruct the incalculable productivity of things that are alive, um, not homo economicus and property, but community and land that is alive, that redoubles value, that plants one seed and gets 10. And this shifted habit of mind that we've been talking about, uh, you know, is already in dialogue with, with uh, those we were listening to yesterday with, uh, uh, with black feminists who contemplate another language, another way of thinking beyond what humans have been in the last 100, 500 years. These are also the very networks of mutualism, care, maintenance, and kinship that are at the heart of indigenous, black feminist, abolitionist thinking that potentially overwhelm capital with rival modes of exchange that are embedded in space. Spatial variables can strengthen rearrangements that provide some relief from patriarchy, violent policing, gentrification, and dispossession. Um, and, uh, sorry, oops. Um, and, and provide also some approach to the equally incalculable uh, reparations. You're looking at, you know, an experimental scenario for interplay that essayed, not a 30,000 foot master plan, by the way, but a, a, an experimental scenario for interplay that essayed the potentials for diverting funds from monoculture, agriculture, and monoculture policing in an unusual community land trust that mixes urban and rural land in, in Minneapolis. Um, and another that looks at agrarian trusts for aggregating exhausted farmland uh, for renewable energy and reparations. And to borrow from Isabel Stengers, how do you convert capital's chains of dependence back to relationships of interdependence? So here's another example that looks at dismantling some of the financial multipliers of sprawl uh, that's at risk of flood and wildfire and asks what would happen if you tie their mortgage approval to heavy climate values rather than only financial abstractions. And not unlike uh, maybe you've seen sort of rewired kidney, kidney donor networks, it proposes changes to how mortgages can be grouped. So rather than being grouped for the thousands in subdivisions or bundled in subprimes, it allows mortgage owners another degree of collectivity in trading the value of their property to reduce collective risk. So a problem, a risk in another arrangement becomes a resource and, and maybe a multiplier or a counter contagion of sprawl. Well, another example, um, uh, continually reproducing the modern mind and its toupee is culture is still addicted to the techno solutionist thinking and in the transportation world a shift to electric or automated vehicles promises to reduce emissions but more important than the technology change is the shift away from individually owned cars which however smart if used in lieu of transit will create unprecedented um, congestion so maybe a second order innovation involves a richer relationship between technologies, high capacity transit and low capacity cars, AVs, bikes, and pedestrians create a productive chemistry that, that gets cars off the road, reduces emissions, vehicle miles traveled and sprawl. So it's a switch, you know, a, a physical spatial volume, <clears throat> excuse me, for these exchanges has the capacity to consolidate itineraries that ripple cars, and it's the mixture vehicles that can address any coordination and disability penetrating areas that have been high mobility. 
So the multiplying effects of this counter contagion even have the capacity to dissolve lanes of traffic in parking lots and garages. And finally, you know, there's no elementary particle, no one source of conflict. Rather, in the buckshot of colonizing and capitalizing the globalizing period, empires masquerading, masquerading as nations, together with kingdoms and totalitarian regimes, develop forms of subjugation using nested and contradictory forms of, of sovereignty as camouflage. I use the free zone to try to talk about that. Um, but in this moment, uh, that recalls so many other episodes of international activism. What are the capacities for planetary solidarity? You know, indigeneity is a term circulating in multiple struggles now against settler colonialism and accounting for the diaspora of all those forcibly moved as slaves or migrants of conflict. Sadia Hartman has suggested that indigeneity might be not about a political claim, but about a certain inhabitation of the earth or relation to the earth that doesn't regard it as a possession. So can you construct a planetary commons to facilitate cooperation and migration through an exchange of needs? This fight is a fight for, while, while not abandoning fights for land and, and territory, this fight is for another kind of land that doesn't respond to the wide ass logics of war, enclosure and geometry. It's the live, unpredictable, feral, after annexing landscapes that flood, catch fire, seep into contours, creep up from behind. They cannot be enclosed. And they might be the subject of cooperative work from various positions in the diaspora. Um, these are, what are the exchange networks for those who might say, I don't really want your citizenship or your victimhood or your structured racism or your bad jobs. I don't want to stay in your country. And, temperamentally then xenophobic politics is left to throw itself against an open door. This is a planetary solidarity that tends not towards the universal, but towards the patchy and the partial that's multiplied many times. Um, but anyway, nothing works or, or no one thing works. And what's been under discussion here is not a thing, but an ever present approach to many things and expanded means to generate change on the flip side of some dominant cultural habits um, that considers space at a time when it's so clearly an instrument of violence and subjugation, but also repair and survival. So here on the flip side, ans right answers are mistakes, obligations are empowering, histories follow latent aggressions as well as gunshots, messy is smarter than new, and responses shouldn't always work. And maybe it's possible to steal some of the powers of infrastructure space and design a ratcheting chain of moves to worm into and, and generate leverage against these intractable politics. You have to be kind of too smart to be right. Anyway, thank you. <laughs>